Paul Klee is a unique and enigmatic figure we associate with many styles of painting, from Expressionism through Cubism, Surrealism and Orientalism to pure abstract. He's a painter whose experiences and acquaintances had a profound effect on his work, as too did many artists and movements from the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics that he came across, to Monet, Picasso, Mondrian and Vasily Kandinsky. In turn, we can actually consider that he was a major influence on artists who followed him, those including the likes of Miro, Jackson Pollock, Robert Motherwell, and even Jean-Michel Basquiat. This is, after all, a story of retromodernism and therefore a virtual timeline connecting up not only all the little fragments that made Paul Clay the unique genius that he was, but also gathering in and linking the artists who fed into his psyche and his work. He grew up in a musical household and music was a constant factor in his life, either teaching or using visual metaphors for music or colour scales in his work. Now, from an early age, he was a talented musician and especially a talented draftsman. And I think we can see from this early sketch of his bedroom that not only is he very precise, but he also has a bent towards shading, hatching, and an almost musical rhythmic pencil stroke that he uses. A little later, Clay enrolls at the Munich Academy of Fine Arts, where he was tutored by Franz von Stuck, an accomplished painter in his own right, who painted this beautiful, perhaps his most well-known painting, was The Sin, this incredible mix of angst and lust, but also exposed Clay to ancient Egypt and classical mythology, as well as that, the idea that forms could be mixed, as occurs in this painting of Orpheus. Humanistic figurative painting is sort of jumbled up with Egyptian icons, the Nile crocodile and the flamingo. Clay will go on to experiment heavily with mixed techniques and symbolism that he saw with von Furst, as well as, I guess, incorporating some of the influential thinkers of the time, Charles Darwin they'd have been reading, as well as Nietzsche, of course, and Sigmund Freud. And around about 1902, Clay visits Rome, Florence and Naples, but he shied away from the humanism that he found there, rather twisting its perfection and beauty into caricature, echoing cartoons also by von Stuck and by the Italian divisionist painter Giovanni Segantini in this haunting Cattivi Madri or Bad Mothers from about 1894. Clay experimented then with many styles, but never quite latched on to anything in particular. In 1911, he did, however, meet the eclectic artist Alfred Kubin, who introduced him to the Blauer Reiter group led by Vasily Kandinsky, Franz Marc and August Merker. But it wasn't until he visited Tunisia in 1914 that Clay felt he'd finally understood colour. Unfortunately, 1914 also marked the beginning of World War I. Clay served and continued to work and to riff off radical new work he'd seen firsthand at pre-war art shows organised in Munich by the gallerist Hans Goltz. By 1920, Clay was enjoying commercial success and he was invited to teach at Adolf Gropus' legendary Bauhaus. Once again, he came into contact with Kandinsky and with a young Joseph Albers, whose early work with colour blocking, actually he used to work in glass, besides impressing the hell out of clay, also makes him a precursor to the likes of Mark Rothko. All of these ingredients, diverse styles and artistic inspirations, as well as a pretty hefty dose of inner darkness, coursed through his mind, his veins, and his brushes for the next 20 years or so. Sadly, he was so out there, however, that Hitler and the Nazis, when they came to power in the 30s, picked out Clay's work with a few others, 
and they took it around Germany, putting on shows that they called degenerate art shows. He was also fired from his job at the Bauhaus, and he recorded his mood with this painting called Struck from the List. Clay combined his acquired languages of colour and draftsmanship to completely invent a new creative dialect. Symbols were recognised as important in their own right, such as Monet's Red Sun in Impression Sunrise, the birth of Impressionism practically. He used the divisionist technique at different points in his career, including the work many call his greatest, also with the ever-present sun motif. A sun that changed from burning red to burned out black as illness dogged him in his later years. That sun finally set in 1940. His last painting left on his easel was untitled and unsigned but later named Angel of Death. Clay's ability to somehow infuse even the most childlike images with a depth and a gravitas led Marcel Duchamp to label him incomparable in 1949. We'll never know with 100% certainty, of course, how much time Jackson Pollock or Jean-Michel Basquiat actually did spend in galleries or in books looking at the work of Paul Clay. What we can say with absolute certainty is that there are traces, which we've already seen in this video, which connect them on that timeline, that essential retromodernist timeline. They share a sense of adventure, they share a willingness to experiment, and most strikingly the primitivism we associate with the Cobra group of painters, for example, later on with Jean de Buffet and Art Brut, and even contemporary artists like Daniel Cruz Chubb. I hope you've enjoyed this particular video. Again, uh, I hope it's getting clearer and clearer now what we intend with retromodernism. And if you've had value from this, please subscribe. As ever, like the video, leave your comments, and of course I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can. There is another follow-up video coming. I hope that'll be out in a couple of weeks. And it's a fairy tale, so watch out for that one. Thanks for being with me, and take care for now. Bye-bye.